<laughs> oh, I do. I do. Um, it's okay. This one's really pretty simple. We've kind of already talked about it. There is a whole wealth of distributed applications and uh, that exist on blockchain, and fundamentally, these are what we are here to support. Um, there are also identity providers, and we work with uh, uh, at least one of these identity providers. Um, it's public, so you probably know who it is. Probably uh, announced. Um, and really, where we sit is, you know, there are public chains that provide public accountability for transactions, and they are incredibly useful. And we um, work with them for things like writing to a public chain for vital records, for example. But you have to have a public chain. Uh, using it for identity, but really providing that big data, blockchain-based, HIPAA compliant, regulatory compliant um, network that allows data to really be interoperable across all of these different systems. That's where we sit. There you go. I'm going to learn more. So um, what we'll do is before questions, first question gets a t-shirt. If you need to leave now, how many people are in a time bind and need to skedaddle? Anybody? Okay. <laughs> so if you want to, feel free. I want you guys to not feel like you're trapped here uh, because we're approaching an hour. So I'm here, basically, I manage the developer community. So any of you that want to get on to the first chain, you would basically contact me and we would get you a login and get you into the system. Um, but any questions for Frank or Tyson? How about Tyson? Oh, and one last thing. We are going to have Tyson available. If anybody wants to do it, I can call it Get Geeky with Tyson. Uh, anybody interested in going into a conference room and doing some firmware whiteboarding at all? Developers at all that want to do that? All right, just checking. So, um, you had a question? Yeah. Or Tyson or, <coughs> or I, I don't know. any of them? Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you guys come on up? So, before first, raise your hand. First <laughs> one was one of the first ones in the building to jump over and start using, utilizing the platform. So, feel free to ask him any questions too. That'd be nice. We just talked to him about, it took about two weeks to port our personal health record application into the blockchain uh, using the API. All right. Uh, I guess I guess like I guess I'm kind of missing the, the, the point of why personal number of blockchain at all. Like I, I, it, it seems like all this stuff is uh, easy to do with, with the distributed identifiers that probably whoever your identity partners using underneath. And I guess I'm kind of missing where the where that piece comes in. Um, like like why do you need a private blockchain to store this information versus just being able to produce, produce like a cryptographic but you certainly can. That was one of the examples I gave you. I mean, that's what a lot of people are doing right now. Is you know, keeping them in their databases, writing hashes out somewhere publicly, so that there's a way of saying that you know this data is still removable and hasn't changed. Given that kind of public um, attestation of data. But what we're trying to accomplish with first chain is a little bit more than that around consent and ownership. So that's not inherent blockchain. It's not inherent data. Stuff. I mean, you can get there with a lot of work and other things to enable the databases and other things to kind of give that kind of consent. Um, but at the level we're talking about, and then basically the mutability and distribution of the, the platform being HIPAA compliant already, it's, it's the culmination of all the attributes together. If you want to, um, we have one client who's on the platform and they're only using it for really the mutability aspect and provability and audit trail of data, they're not really using it for consent. Um, you can get there through other technologies for sure, but there, but some of the benefits of what you get inherent in the blockchain, you have those capabilities on top of what you get regular data. So it's it's not that those things aren't possible with other technologies. There are, um, you know, you can, you can stop using HTTP and use TCP/IP and still get there. I mean, you can still transmit data a number of different ways <coughs> through GDP. So it's not that it's the only tool in the box. It's just that for this particular use cases and some others, I think there's advantages to being on this platform and trying to hold your own essentially. So I'm, I want to throw something else real quick. So our fundamental principle is that we don't want to own and control everything at some point in time. You know, what's nice about using blockchain methods, you know what I'm saying, blockchain methods, because there's lots of different ways to do this, is 
is the whole concept of the distributed network and that participants in the network don't have to be <coughs> the same organization in terms of managing managing nodes that process uh, elements of, of the chain. <clears throat> and so we, we see at some point in time this becomes more of a, a we'd like it to be more of a public, public chain than a private chain. And when we focus on a second and third level protocols, it lets us Let's just really create this concept of smart objects <coughs> that are transportable across uh, governance zones with, within the system. Um, so if you're familiar with some of the, the general blockchain concepts besides the normal ledger, <coughs> there's a lot of research around this whole concept of side chains and strong federations. And what, we did, what we've done is we've laid a foundation to actually implement those things because the, the, the broad picture of data sovereignty you know, there's lots of rules and regulations of, of data ownership and management across geographical and political boundaries. And we want to be able to encapsulate those within a system that, that follow a piece of data along. <clears throat> and while some of the inherent data sharing things can be used in, in other methods, it's hard to really build this broader data grid transactional system without some form of trust authentication. Is what stopped you guys from getting there the stuff around the regulatory side and the compliance as far as who's controlling the node, who's controlling the, the, the location of the data around the compliance stuff, or I mean, otherwise I guess that I feel like it makes sense to go to a federated type system. Yeah, it's, it's, really, it's really not a HIPAA driver, per se, because you know, HIPAA only applies here in the U.S. I mean, you step out of the U.S., it doesn't apply. I mean, if you, in some, some geographic reasons, you can't take information about um, a citizen outside the bounds of that country, supposedly. But so it's it's really more how if you if you have to assume on a broader kind of layer layered security model that what's inherently insecure and what's inherently secure. And you know, we chose an approach to where we can make the data and the data object itself self-contained in a security model and assume at some point in time the underlying frameworks are, are themselves insecure. So when you think about a mine a, a traditional mining uh, a mining node within even a blockchain space, it, it can be anybody. You're just competing, and it's based on your good behavior. So what's what's been limiting us is is really testing some of the advanced security techniques that we believe are essential to allow anybody to join the process, process or store uh, those data objects without being able to reconstruct them. So that's kind of something we're working on. I guess to me it seems uh, counterintuitive. Like you, you, when you say the use case. Uh, uh, wouldn't be able to share your genomic data uh, with somebody to get a loan um, because it's forbidden by the government. But is that, that almost seems to fly in the face of the principles of SSID, which is like, hey, I, it's my genomic data, I'm going to do whatever I want with yeah. it or whatever. I, don't know. I guess it, it just seems. So, very you have to, I, yeah, but you know, you, you have, the world's a bigger place, and there's lots of lots of governments that, that aren't, aren't really out for individual freedom liberty. So while we believe what you believe is that you should have a right to your, to your data, most states in the United States don't believe you own your own data. So I think the last, I mean it's like two or three to say you actually are on it. Now this, this CMS is pushing a broader uh, access and ownership for individuals, but even even here it's not, it's not a common, it's not a common principle. So if, if we're going to get to the next phase, which is kind of person-centric, all about you, or in population of one, you have to be able to, to basically leverage and use that in, in your own ways and cross a lots of data boundaries. Where blockchain works is where you have lots of data providers of some kind. Um, not anyone owns it. Um, and you can, again, use some methods you know, for just identity and, and, and dealing with sovereign DDID standards, which, which are foundation is just more of how you deal with the attestations. Well, you don't you don't need blockchain for everything. But you know it fits really nicely when you're dealing with longitudinal issues, with multi owners and multi permissions, all contributing, and you want to keep things in sync. That's what works nicely, without relying on a central institution to do that. And and we're just we're just kind of a big believers in that. You know, and uh, it's uh, there's we've been asked. Uh, and then I'll shut up for the next question. We've been asked multiple times to do certain things and we've said no because we don't fit there. We don't think the technology is good to do. We don't think the technology by itself is a good basis technology to build deep integrations and EMRs and HISs. Because you can do that.
that more effectively and that, with other methods. Um, you know, as one example, we don't believe it's a it's a pure analytics platform because again, you can do a little cleaner with other methods. Question. Actually, I have a question. So, um, you know, this is the first time I've seen you in the company. Uh, are you, you all planning to do it before uh, have you done ICO or planning to do ICO in the future? That's a that's a great question. You want to take that one? No. So easy. we poked at it. We were kind of late in the cycle, right. so we pulled it back. Um, you know, there's lots of changes on the regulatory side, and we've actually helped write write some um, and and submitted inputs both here in the U.S. as well as through the OECD, which is a European regulatory body, um, and helped a couple sovereign nations create create their ICO frameworks and token frameworks. Bermuda's one, Mauritius on custody, and, uh, and a few others that are kind of in yeah. safe havens. Yeah. So, will we go back out and do that? I'm not sure. Uh, it's, it, it really depends, you know, on how the regu regulatory environment unfolds itself. But at some point, I think there's a transactional uh, economy in here right. that will lend itself very nicely to, to tokens and tokenization. Right. I'm just not sure we're, we're quite there from a regulatory side. Yeah, we'll pass on you. Um, the second question, uh, once the platform actually migrates from Ethereum to something that's more scalable, are you going to move this platform to a different? Yeah, we we're not relying on Ethereum. No, no. I, I, no, we only interact with Ethereum at that monetization level. So we don't want to be in charge of the cryptocurrency adjudication of payment between one or the other. That's where their adjudication points are. That's their play. That's what they do. Right. So we are our own leisure and our own watching. We do we integrate with Ethereum. In the case of vital records, if there has to be a public cash for that kind of use case that we can interact with. We're going to adjudicate transaction between your data and another party. We can adjudicate that on Ethereum. So we use Ethereum as that financial layer. Well, same, same with the Bitcoin network. We can try and transact. Yeah, we'll that. Right. XRP yeah. is like 4.6 seconds. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, somebody else had a question back. Yes, sir. How are you dealing with the requirements, regulatory requirements around deleting data? Is that no one has access to the data anymore? And that's because I'm assuming you're not removing blocks from your chain. So no. So one of the things that we do is that, um, remember I said there are ways to update a block within here and maintain the integrity of the chain. Yeah. There is a delete block that's added and we actually do do some other work to do deletion of data from the blockchain. So are you not using the hashing technique that all other blockchains? We are. We can get into that in the whiteboard session, but yeah. okay. Yeah, so think, think about it, again, as I said, methods and when we're painting the second and third level protocols, there's a space for the immutability of the ledger, and, we, and we'll use that aspect, but there's also, if you think about it, we're dealing with the immutability. What we're really focused on immutability is state, and state contains part of the data, or contains the data, but it's a much broader, broader footprint than just the data itself. So as it moves from state to state, that's what we're attesting to, is the state uh, the, the condition of the data at, at this state is what it needs to be based on. So, so you're just hashing metadata, not the actual data? No, so it's still, still hashing the core data. That's part, part of our patents following. So again, it's second, third level protocol. Hang with Tyson afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure who was next, so I'm going to go. Anyone please leave me? Crap, please. <laughs> How do you get this into the marketplace? Like, how do you actually make it this into patients, like the hands of patients? Well, again, so um, we are the we are the enablement platform between other companies writing applications. So, uh, Kirsten, one of uh, his is is a personal medical record application. So, it's his application that's doing the, the harvesting of the individual medical records, putting them on the blockchain, so that they follow all the you know, you know, the rules of the blockchain as we use ability and auditability and ownership and all that. But it's really his application that's delivering that to the consumer. So again, we're not writing to the app to do that. We're not trying to be the consumer in the time. Okay, so you're not writing to the consumer. You're using that on the on that, with the whole concept of a sovereign ID, where does the consumer education come from to tell them 
potential threats to opportunities. How, I mean, you know, because of the sovereign ID situation, we've not written out a, a, a driver's license. Are they going to get pinged asking for consent? And, and how do they know? Yeah, I don't think all those questions are answered yet. Okay. I mean, it's been very, so we think, we pick some very small jurisdictions to work with, with a couple of our partners in the government. For me, it's one of them. There's only 61,000 people in all of the community. The next one has a few hundred million. But, you know, to work through those mechanisms, and, and in my humble opinion, it becomes transparent in the background. You know, the attestation can still be, one of the attestations can still be your driver's license. It's really how it's embedded in the app. The reality is if you if you look at things within fraud detection and other marketing profiles, people are creating an identity around you and, and, and who you are and your data profile. So we do something very similar. We just give them exposure to it. And that's what some of the other regulatory issues are. But I don't think there's a clean user interface for all this just yet. What are your clients doing? They're, I mean, nobody reads terms and conditions. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's the whole South Park thing with the yeah, um, absolutely. So what, what are your current clients going to let the people that are involved in these things know what to expect? Yeah, it, it starts out with, with kind of a very direct use case. So, so you, let's, let's just take our Bermuda use case. You get an identity. Uh, around your identity is a number of attestations provided by the government because it's a government-sponsored program. And self-attestations. Self this is me as well. That you say, okay, this is my identity and a way to present the identity. That's where it's like. And then your ability to see, okay, what what attributes are tagged to me that make up my identity and I don't want that one anymore, that was wrong. So it gives you the ability to add add or delete things that are attributed to you, you as a person. Um, that's the first use, and that's where I think it starts. I mean, you look at a lot of the consumer <coughs> side of GDP, GDPR solutions are not very easy to use, particularly if they're cutting across any one system. It's very similar to patient portals. I can see my data in that one, I can see my data in that one, I can see my data in that one. It's not very universal. And I think that that's where some of the innovation stuff happen. Do you, do you have support for zero knowledge groups on the roadmap? Yes, got a, yes, we do. We've got a patent on it. Does that count? <laughs> that's actually one. That's, that's one of the building blocks for us to be able to create public notice, and that's what we're at. That's one of the pieces that we are like you said, we already have a patent on it. That's one of the building blocks we have. The other one is the encryption and the other patent that we have filed. So that's for our roadmap. I don't have a time on it, but that's that's what's going to enable us to then go to public, have public notice in the way that we really want it. So in that world where you have zero knowledge groups, there's support for the zero knowledge groups. That Will actually like you know a federated system or a national distributed system. I guess um, who then like who then attests to that information? Will you guys be the kind of arbiter of that? Like will you be signing to say we well, have this witness basically? Or and where's where's root trust? You still need root trust, right? What's up? You still need root trust, even zero knowledge. Some yeah. some variation. Well, we started. You know, I think. Where I think you're going to see the most technical technology advancements are in all the fundamental proofs uh, within the system. And because we're seeing, we're already seeing uh, lots of different approaches to how consensus is built, um, both proof of work, proof of stake, um, and some of the authentication methods. Uh, so while we have an opinion on how some, which ones work best for us now, we're trying to be a little agnostic to let a whole lot of people spend in spending a gazillion dollars there to fight it out. Um, I mean, just as a side note, I met a guy yesterday, we can have a fun conversation uh, about this a few days ago, that actually Cornell University announced um, uh, in conjunction with this person a mathematical proof that, it, that would uh, compute infinite primes. And so as part of that, he created, in, there's an inherent set of patterns in there. And if you apply those patterns, right, you basically break pretty much all public private key. Crypto, which is kind of interesting. But you can create a new kind of crypto, which is pretty fun. Any other questions? No? You guys are awesome. <laughs> 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 Grab a cookie.
networking, and we also have 